whether they're doing a money movement task or they're on the go trying to get support, whatever it is, we just want to kind of meet clients where they are and enable them to accomplish their task easily and efficiently and in whatever modality they choose. So if they want to do it by voice or text, tap, call, whatever it is, we want to enable them to have that power. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Welcome everyone to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, Randy Kassar, and I'm so pumped today to bring you another amazing guest in the field of conversational AI. And we are talking with someone that has a deep uh, mindset and approach to human-centered design, is leading the emerging experiences in NLU over at Truist, and it's none other than Alex Mishasek. Welcome, Alex. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So yeah, we're so excited that you're here. Uh, we got connected via the magic of the social web and LinkedIn, uh, and we also talked to a previous coworker of yours over at Citizens, uh, Bill Hawks. And so it's great to connect with you and kind of dive into the world that you see in terms of NLU and emerging experiences over at Truist. So thanks for joining us. So let's uh, get started here. Uh, let's uh, jump on the first question that we always ask our guests. What is one myth about conversational AI that you would like to debunk? Perhaps it's something that you've heard uh, that you have to re-explain yourself that is just not true. And then you just want to lay it out there and tell everybody uh, to move along. Uh, what would be your, uh, your myth to debunk? Yeah, I'd say the one that I tend to hear the most is that AI is advancing too quickly or that it's going to take all of our jobs away. Yeah. Um, I think given that I've been in the industry a while, I've seen that these platforms have been around for a very long time and many aren't even aware that they were around in the 90s. Um, yeah. So they've just evolved a lot and become more readily available. And as we have the increase in social media and um, the sensationalism around it, I think that is making it feel like it's moving faster or evolving faster, but it's really the same platforms evolving at a pretty steady pace. And I think for banking specifically, it's harder to keep that pace, um, but it doesn't seem yeah. to be evolving any faster than before from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, since the 90s, that's, that's kind of mind blowing, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I know there's been a lot of work uh, being done, uh, you know, whether it's behind the scenes on the data science side, um, but it, it's really interesting to see where it's come, especially in the past six months. Um, so tell us, uh, you know, for those that don't know you, kind of, how did you get started in, in, in uh, you know, getting the, the role that you have now? Where did, the, where did this um, expertise uh, start? Yeah, I actually uniquely got interested in this field when Watson went on Je Jeopardy. Um, okay. That was, I was actually at IBM at the time and I was working on, you know, other mobile web design projects and yeah became really interested in machine learning once I saw Watson succeed. And I was like, hey, I wanna know more about this. I wanna know how this works and a little bit under the hood. So once I started working on side projects around like how Watson can influence the education industry or healthcare and kind of innovate there, I yeah. started getting hooked on machine learning and started working on projects in Texas Analytics at the time. I don't know what it's called now. Um, but mainly got into taking large data sets, um, training models, extracting sentiment, all of that, and figuring out what insights we could draw out of that and leverage in our experience design process. And so uh, when you first started kind of getting into the machine learning side of things, uh, what was that point where that aha moment where you're like, oh, wow, this definitely has potential or like I'm really interested in kind of going into that route? What was that Aha moment. Yeah, I'd say I think the text analytics work because I started taking Twitter data in my spare time and like extracting sentiment, building different extractors on the canvas and teaching myself the tools, even yeah. though at the time I was just 
you know, doing minimal writing and designing for those experiences. But I really wanted a deep dive and started meeting with all my dev and tech partners all the time, just so I could get a full understanding of how it works. Cause I really wanted to use the platforms in my day to day. And at the time they were only available as B2B platforms. So they didn't have the availability that we have now with like more subscription model services. Totally. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, Truist. So what's your role there now? And then, you know, we talked about your title in terms of uh, head of NLU and emerging experiences, but what does that day-to-day -day look like to you? Yeah, our day-to-day, -day, it, it changes depending on the day, but a lot of it um, involves writing the different utterances and intents for the bot. We're training the bot with different slot values, figuring out uh, how we can leverage these platforms to better understand our clients and to give them just a better experience in general, um, whether they're doing a money movement task or they're on the go trying to get support, whatever it is, we just want to kind of meet clients where they are and enable them to accomplish their task easily and efficiently and in whatever modality they choose. So if they want to do it by voice or text, tap, call, whatever it is, we want to enable them to have that power. Awesome. Yeah. Multimodality is super key. It's what people expect now, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as you're uh, building these experiences, are there things that are specific towards the banking industry that you have to focus on uh, other than other industries? Um, I'd say, well, the obvious answer is like regulatory, legal um, constraints. But I will say, given that we are a new segment that formed right when I started, um, a lot of our, our process has been built from the ground up and we've had the ability to be a little more scrappy than some of the more traditional lines of businesses. So there are obviously pros and cons to that, but I think it's given us a little more flexibility in terms of what we would normally have to follow from a process and pr procedures perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a little bit like the Wild West, but it still gives us a lot of opportunity to fail fast. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, what your North Star is, you know, what your overall kind of goal is as a team, um, what do you tell your team in terms of what's, you know, how you kind of, what your mission is? Yeah, so our North Star, we kind of, we have a team mission that basically applies to all features and projects. And that's similar to what I just told you, enriching our clients' lives, allowing them to engage naturally, um, not making clients conform to our banking conventions yeah. and being available on the go 24 seven omni-channel. Um, so that's like our big bucket mission that evolves. I mean, that aligns to Truist Broader's mission. And yeah. then every feature that we work on, we have a separate North star, but it aligns to that broader vision. So we yeah. always start with that um, initial goal and vision of a project. And then, mm -hmm figure out how to take the incremental steps to get there and actually execute on it. And I guess the next question is, how do you measure that success? Uh, and yes. I think that's, that's, that's always a big question. You know, do you have a dashboard that you look at on a daily basis? Is there something that your team looks at? Like what is, what, what's that uh, kind of analytics? Data yeah, analysis that's, have? that's a great question. We are very green there. I think our old platform that we had, was through live person and it had a very extensive conversational cloud that allowed us to, you know, dig deep into the intents and utterances and figure mm -hmm. out what our clients are saying. Um, right now we're kind of building it all from scratch after we've migrated to new platforms. So yeah. we're in the early stages of metrics, but we still know um, we're able to look at certain things like CSAT and yeah. we know what we want to prioritize in terms of, you know, sentiment and, where are clients leaving the conversation? What are they doing before they engage in our channel? Um, conversion rates, if we're promoting a product contextually and then sending them to apply, uh, you know, the typical yeah. quant and qual research, we do that regularly internally with our experience design team. But we definitely have a lot of things we want to track and that we would love <laughs> to have in our dashboard. We're just in the process of building yeah. it. Yeah, no, same here. Yeah, no, I think there's, Lots of things, uh, you, know, you can have the biggest dashboard in the world, but at, at the end of it, you need to have the insights as well, right? 
Exactly. I think that uh, requires resources, uh, but AI can help in that as well. So interesting. Um, thanks for sharing that. It's, it's, it's really interesting on, on how uh, you guys uh, are going about your North Star and, and measuring success. Um, so you're, you're a leader of your team. How big is your team that you have now? Uh, it's changed a lot over the years. And now we're kind of, we operate in a triad model at Truist. Yeah. So uh, engineering and product and design leads all kind of partner closely on everything yeah. from roadmap to vision. And across our scrum teams, we probably have, I don't know, I'd say 40 something people, but we're very, very new and early. Like I said, we just migrated yeah. over to Amazon. So we have the ability to do a lot of the things we want to do now. We just have to get there and actually yeah. build it. Yeah. Make it happen. Totally. Um, so, uh, you know, as a leader, what, what are some of the challenges that you have in, in, in the, you, that you challenge your team in, in making the best possible agent and customer experience? Yeah, I try, I, I can't say I always do this successfully, but I try <laughs> to just encourage them to innovate, push the envelope. Um, it's especially in banking or large corporation environments. I feel like people tend to just limit their, themselves naturally by whatever they already know about product or yeah. regulations. And I think I try to encourage my team to just ignore that until they get to meeting with myself or my partners and let us be the ones that scale it back versus them limiting themselves. Because I do think we always end up with a much better product and feature when they are, you know, when they're able to have the space and the white space to actually create what they want to create um, yeah. instead of limiting it before they even get to the review process. So if there was one tip that you could give uh, other leaders that are listening in right now that are kind of going through some of your challenges, what would that one tip be? Um, I would say we've had, we've had great success with that whole making sure you stop and paint that North star vision. I know we already mentioned North star and it can get reused a lot. Um, it's kind of yeah. one of those buzzwords that people talk about all the it's time, but it does, it makes a difference. I, I feel like, especially with banking environments, you tend to inherit a roadmap and then you execute on that roadmap and it can quickly shift you to more of a production design mentality. And the way we've kind of maintained control over the design is partnering closely with our um, tech and product partners beforehand, before they even create the roadmap. So our research is heavily influencing that. And then when it gets to time for us to work on our features, we're working on them several PIs ahead so that by the time we get to actual dev needing to code it, we have a really strong idea of where we want to go, how we're going to get there, and what the phases are in order to get there. Okay, great, great. Um, so you've been in the industry for a while. Uh, you've seen lots of different vendors come through. Um, trying to sell you different things and kind of curious, what are the top three questions that you have for vendors when you're at, at that others probably could use in their own evaluation of software? I would say the first question is always, what are, what are the key value props? What do you offer and why is it different? How does it differ from the competitors? Um, that one's typically, surprisingly, that's actually hard for some people to answer. Um, but that's always number one. I think, Another big question is getting some kind of case study or relevant example around the industry. So mm -hmm. given I'm in banking, I want to see a case study that they have had successfully implementing the platform in a financial environment because that has its own set of challenges. Of course. Um, yeah. And then probably, uh, I don't know, like, is there the ability to, it, once you implement the platform, is there ability to customize um, what kinds of upcoming features do they have planned? That kind of thing. Okay, well, those are great tips. I, I definitely uh, in line with you there. Um, and as we talked about, you know, this industry is changing so rapidly, uh, and not just this year, but over the you know over the course of your career. Um, are there certain people that you follow to stay up to date on the technology side of things? That's a good question. I tend to. I tend to more generally follow people I know, like really strong leaders that I've interfaced with in the past or met at a conference, worked with. I follow them from a leadership perspective, regardless of the industry they're in. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to this specific space, I just follow the news closely. 
So whether it be on LinkedIn or TechCrunch, um, I definitely look at like Amazon, Google, big Fortune 100 companies, what they're doing. And I think it's important, especially to look at analogous competitors. And I encourage my team to do this all the time. I think a lot of banks tend to only look at other banks and that limits their roadmap and their strategy. And um, I don't think we're ever going to be able to leapfrog anyone if we're only looking at the direct competitors. So totally. a lot of times we look at Amazon, Spotify, DoorDash, whatever it is, it might not even relate to banking, but those apps and products use the same mental models that clients are using in their day-to-day -day life. So it's important to look at them. Yeah, for sure. Um, b b uh, before we start, uh, you were talking about different events that you're going to be speaking at. Um, you want to share some of the events that you're speaking at? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm speaking at CXFS in Boston, uh, end of next month. Uh, and that's a great conference. I actually got involved um, with from Doug Reardon in the past. He's one of those leaders I mentioned that I admire. Yeah. Um, and then another leader, Todd Keith, I'll be doing a panel with Todd. Um, and I think that's one of those things. It's hard to, once you do it once and meet such great people that you admire, it's really hard to ever say no again. You just get excited <laughs> about doing it again. Yeah, um, sure. So I'm excited to do that. And then later on in the year, uh, there's another financial conference in Miami where I'll be leading a workshop around slotting and training bots in these platforms. Very cool. All right. Well, what we'll do is uh, we'll get the links from you after the show. We'll put them in the show notes so everyone can uh, listen in and, and uh you can spread the word about what you're doing. So that's really Thank cool. You. Yeah. No worries. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. All right. And uh, you know, we always have to ask kind of a future question. Um, who knows what the future is, you know, a year from now, but uh, from your perspective, uh, in terms of we'll say generative AI, how do you see that progressing o over the course of, of the next year? That's a great question. I haven't fully thought about that yet. I'm still trying to catch up. Um, but I do think, I mean, I've noticed even with myself, I'm using like chat GBT like platforms to plan my meals, my workouts, my grocery list. Yeah, There are a lot of day-to-day -day things that you can leverage these platforms for. So once the right companies harness that um, in an efficient way, I think it's going to yeah. blow up even faster. And I've also seen us going to, it's not only making just everyday people, I think, more comfortable with these technologies and more exposed to it, but it's also making them more curious. And yeah. I think there's a lot of that digital physical space that hasn't been fully explored yet in like the AR, VR world. Um, and I think these generative AI platforms are making people more curious about that. Yeah, it'll be interesting how Apple takes their, their new uh, release yeah. and does that. So can't wait to get a, a hold of that uh, in in some time, once the price goes down for me. Yeah, a little too pricey <laughs> right now. <laughs> but it's definitely got a lot of potential, a lot of opportunity. Yes, I agree. Well, cool. Uh, so let's uh, get on to the rapid fire section of the podcast. Uh, it's always a fun time to kind of get to know you a little bit better. So we'll do uh, the first one that we always ask, uh, especially to those that are involved within the kind of the, the CX and contact center side of things. Um, what is one person that you wish could answer the phone. You're calling the contact center. It's uh, you have a challenge, uh, an issue, uh, you know, problem with a service, and that person would be a celebrity. It could be an artist, a musician, uh, dead or alive. Who would that one person be that could just ease all everything and just solve your problem right away? I feel like my answer for this one is very weird, <laughs> so I'm a little <laughs> embarrassed to say it. But um, first person who comes to mind is JFK Jr. because I admire him so much. Uh, you said dead or alive, so yeah, yeah, really, I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think he just has had this like charisma and I don't know, contagious personality, humility to him. Obviously, the Kennedy family was very famous and yeah. well off, and he was just very down to earth and did a lot for the community and is good at uniting all political parties, which <laughs> would be helpful <laughs> in today's environment. So. Yeah, you're calling into someone, you got a problem, they have to like try and get to three or four different people to solve your problem. I mean, that's, you know, agents are, are superheroes in, in a way in that they they have all the information at their fingertips, but they also need to go and kind of find the right thing. So 
Uh, oh yeah. That's, that's I admire one. what they do so much. I tell all of our agents that we partner with, I tell them that all the time because I know I could personally never do it. Um, yeah. It's very stressful. I feel <laughs> like with certain yeah. calls you get. Yeah. Um, what is uh, one thing not on your LinkedIn profile? That's, I haven't really looked at it in a while, but I would say, oh, I actually do have a picture from Lake, Lake Louise as my background. Uh -huh. I am into hiking, nature, uh, mountain biking, and that was from uh -huh. hiking up in Banff, Canada. Oh, so Love that place. Yeah. We, uh, we went there a few years ago, flew into Calgary, and then there was like a two-hour yep. like two drive to Banff. Uh, it was just like so amazing there. So yeah, it reminds me of, uh, of Switzerland and, and the European uh, Alps. Oh, cool. I've never been to Switzerland, yeah. but I would like to go. Put that on your list. That was going to be my next question. Uh, what yeah. is one country you want to spend more time in? Well, Switzerland would be great. <laughs> I definitely Italy. I've been to only a couple places in Italy so far, um, Milan and Venice, but I would really like to go to like Rome, uh, Tuscany. There are a lot of places in Italy I could spend months in. Um, <laughs> And I love pasta and wine. So yeah, that would be next. Love it. Um, if you could explain your job to a, my son is uh, going on to fourth grade. How would you explain your job to my son? Oh, that's a good one. I, I still can't even explain it to my family <laughs> and my parents. <laughs> I try to do this all the time. Um, so apparently I don't do it well. I guess I would say if you think about the apps you use on your phone or the experience when you're watching Netflix, someone is designing that and thinking about what you're going to do before you do it and trying to help you enjoy those experiences more and prevent error and make it easier for you. There you go. That works. I think he, he would, he could get that. I love it. <laughs> you can try it out. <laughs> I'll try it out tonight. <laughs> Um, and, and the last question that we'd love to ask is, what's your best day? Best in the, day in, in the, the industry or? No, just in general. Like, what's your best day where you're like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, man, I nailed it. And it was like a good day. And it could be personal. It could be a combo of personal and, and career. Like, you know, what's that best day look like to you? Uh, I would say it, I guess, relates to career because that is where I spend a lot of my time. I think. I have really good days when my team is having a good day. Um, okay. So when it seems like we've kept the peace, everyone's vibing, everyone has their like specialty areas where they're all dividing and conquering. Um, we've kind of gotten into more of a cadence like that lately after a ton of, you know, turnover. Uh, so I think that that does make me feel happy and satisfied because yeah. I do, I am a people pleaser and I do feed off of their energy. So if people are distressed and overwhelmed, um, it definitely influences how I feel when I go to bed at night. So totally. Yeah. I mean, same, same here. Well, cool. Well, thanks, uh, Alex so much for, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate the time today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and then just, uh, leave people with one last thing. If people want to uh, reach out to you, what's the best way to, to reach out to you? Um, yeah, I would say LinkedIn. Uh, I can normally connect with people pretty quickly on there. So if they want to just shoot me a message, that's probably the easiest way. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And right. we will um, talk to all you guys very soon. Uh, you know, this has uh, been a great conversation with Alex and we appreciate her time. Uh, you know, if you guys have any suggestions on guests that we should interview for the future that are within the conversational AI and automation space, maybe within the customer experience space, we want to hear from you. So email us at podcast at unifor.com or just use the hashtag CTM podcast, CTM podcast. Well, this has been another episode, another great episode of Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Rennick Star. You guys have a great day. Thanks, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.